the Republicans saying, not doing it, can't afford $117,000 to um, take care of this problem. The darker the color, the longer the wait. And you may notice a correlation between the long wait times and various demographic factors. So tomorrow morning, Tom Hucker has organized a terrific event at the White Oak Rec Center, which was the proposed 12th early voting site. It's 9.30 at the White Oak Rec Center, um, and a couple of us will be speaking, uh, speaking our minds on that. In addition to tomorrow, we have a, uh, an immigration panel through also the um, Community Education Committee, uh, which should be very exciting these days. October 6th, that's at 2.30 at the Rockville Library, October 6th. We have a happy hour on October 10th. We're gonna be doing some voter registration by mail, letter writing, in addition to traditional happy hour activities. Um, we have a panel on desegregating MCPS and the new boundary analysis which is going to be led by um, Richard Kallenberg of the Century Foundation, um, who is also working on the New York City public school desegregation uh, program with the same contractor that MCPS just hired, WXY. Um, so that's October 17th at 7 p.m., uh, and that's gonna be in the Executive Office building in the auditorium there. Um, and then on October 22nd, um, we have Chris Leonard, whose new book, Coke Land, is about the Koch brothers and how they've done what they've done. It's a blockbuster. He's been on the New York Times, the New Yorker, the National Review, um, not the National Review, the New Republic, excuse me, um, and NPR. Um, so that's October 22nd, that's a luncheon, um, and that's the only event that is not free. Everything else I've listed is free. Um, I wanted to recognize our elected officials. I want to start with Kathleen Connor, who's representing Jamie's office. And then we've got a number of members of the Central Committee. I want to thank you guys all for coming. Mimi Hassanane and um, Scott Goldberg and Susie Kaplan, Jennifer Hosey, and Arthur Edmonds. Did I? our state party. So on behalf of the Women's Democratic Club and all of our members, I would like to present a check to the chair of our state party in support of our members. Presidential campaign 
and even more importantly, you know, how do I interact with them? So today we have some great speakers with us. We have Arthur Edmonds, who's a member of the Montgomery County Democratic Central Committee, and we'll introduce him again later. Marie Mapes, who's also a member of the Montgomery County Democratic Central Committee, and Aruna Miller, former delegate and former member of the Montgomery County Democratic Central Committee. But we're gonna start with our esteemed party chair, Maya Rocky Moore, and the executive director of the state parties, Ben Smith. And they both have a really, really interesting background that makes them um, fit into politics really, really well. Maya, for example, is a health expert, and she has spoken around the country on health issues. She's spoken at Columbia University. She's spoken before the Congressional Black Caucus. In fact, she used to be vice president of the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation. She was a staff member on Ways and Means, so I bet you didn't know she had tax expertise also. She won a decisive election for state party chair, and we're excited to have her and excited to hear her. She'll be speaking along with Ben Smith, who is the executive director, right title, executive director of the Maryland Democratic Party. Now, Ben cut his teeth in politics by starting his own consulting firm. He worked for several candidates, several successful candidates, and he helped run six successful state legislative campaigns. He also was chair of the Baltimore City Democratic Central Committee. So he has a lot of experience in targeting, voter targeting, in voter outreach, and in canvassing. So we're really, really lucky to have Ben and Maya in Montgomery County today. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. Thank you to everyone, uh, the leadership of this organization who organized this. We really appreciate the invitation. All the exalted officials here, including our dear, dear Central Committee members, we just appreciate you all. And all the wants in the room. It's your party and you showed up to hear about the like gory details. And so that means that you're extra special people. Uh, we actually ask that you go and share the information that you learned, the things that are highlighted for you tonight, um, with colleagues, uh, because I think that some of the questions that will be answered tonight, uh, a lot of people share, um, but they just didn't want to spend an hour and a half talking about it. <laughs> so with that, um, uh, one thing uh, I'd just like to add to my intro is that um, my PhD is in political science. And many people think that I'm a policy expert because um, one of my uh, major areas that we were required to study uh, in graduate school is public policy. Uh, but I also did American politics, international relations, and African American studies. Uh, so I'm just a conglomerate of you know all kinds of stuff. Uh, and I'm just pleased as punch uh, to be your party chair. Uh, and so the question becomes, what is a political party? It's not even mentioned in the US Constitution, political parties aren't. But they're so vital to the function of our democracy. Uh, it's important to understand why they're necessary. Uh, parties basically help to organize people uh, basically around, um, uh, around the issues uh, so, and, and around candidates uh, so, that the, so that they can actually direct the control of government. Uh, and so, you know, candidates, excuse me, somebody's trying to call me in. <laughs> so sorry. This is a good time to ask all of you to turn your phones yep. on silent. Thank you. Thank you, <laughs> Thank you, Mark. All right, very good. Um, so parties actually serve as, you know, central points for developing policies, uh, organizing and persuading voters to elect candidates to office. Um, in terms of state parties, uh, we represent and communicate national positions at the state level as well as develop state positions. Uh, we organize elections and the party infrastructure in the state, uh, and we identify and support candidates uh, at the state and local level, as well as educating, recruiting, and mobilizing voters all across the state. Uh, so in terms of you know, the relationship between uh, the, um, the national and the state, you know, we have jurisdiction over the state, uh, and then we also help to support the county level organizing, and then we'll get into this in more detail. Uh, regarding the interaction with the DNC, uh, does Tom Perez get to boss us around? Uh, the answer is no. 
with a caveat. <laughs> and, and the no is, uh, you know, it is, it's still a democratic organization, uh, meaning that, um, you know, while he serves as the lead organizer of the National Party, uh, the inputs and the outputs are democratically derived, meaning that there is a policy and legislative body, uh, just like you had at your central committee level, you know, the aggregate of the body gets to vote uh, in order to determine, you know, policies and positions and rules and regulations. Uh, there are all kinds of um, subcommittees and committees of the DNC, which party, um, party operatives actually um, staff. Uh, and so, you know, the, 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 the aggregate of all of that um, comes out as, uh, you know, the, the Democratic Party um, position. Uh, at the same time, you know, the DNC has a lot of resources uh, that, you know, state parties need. Uh, and so, you know, um, you know, they do provide some limited fundraising support. Uh, they do provide technical assistance um, on organizing state parties. Uh, and they also provide data communications and technology services uh, that many of our state parties rely on. Uh, and so, you know, it's basically an interactive relationship. Uh, you know, we provide uh, support to them uh, and they provide support to us. Uh, we are voting members of the DNC, uh, and uh, you know we uh, help to shape, as I mentioned before, uh, the policies and positions of the DNC. Uh, with regards to the 2020 presidential elections, uh, we educate the state about the candidates. We organize the state for the convention, which is a major task uh, that we actually undertake, uh, which includes managing the delegate selection process for the convention, as well as. Uh, managing, once the nominee has been chosen, managing the, the campaign for the nominee. Uh, so, you know, there are just a lot of things and interactions that we actually have with the DNC. Um, and uh, while it is not a, a dictatorship, I would say that it is a, a democracy. Um, and sometimes, you know, there are different le differing levels of power depending upon whatever the issue is and how the politics manifest. Um, at this point, I think that we're going to get into a larger discussion about the organization here in the state. But before I do that, there was a question earlier about funding sources for the state party. And so I was happy to receive a check. I don't care how much is in it, we are just happy. <laughs> um, because, you know, people tend to give money to candidates. They tend to overlook party infrastructure. And yet, I often say this, that if you're thinking about, um, you know, just the broad uh, scope of the, the political party, including the candidates, I would liken the candidates to the leaves on a tree and, and the party to the, the roots and the branches. Uh, basically, the party is the infrastructure that's necessary for the, the candidates or for the leaves to exist. Uh, and so when you're watering, uh, you know, when you're watering and trying to keep the tree alive, you gotta make sure that you water uh, the roots and the branches as well as put some mist on the, on the leaves. <laughs> um, and yet people just often don't understand uh, why the infrastructure matters. Uh, and you know, frankly, the infrastructure matters because it's the e creates the ecosystem in which candidates can thrive. Uh, and so it's important that we um, understand this, this overall dynamic uh, and support parties as well as candidates. So with that, I turn it over to, oh, before I do, funding sources. So traditionally, the Maryland Democratic Party has historically, um, I think, and disproportionately relied on uh, contributions from our state. Hi, welcome, Senator Kitkins here. Everybody clap. <laughs> Come on in, <laughs> come to the front. Um, so we have our SAC means. Uh, state Advisory Committee. Our State Advisory Committee, which is comprised of all of the federal um, congressional um, uh, representatives. Uh, we have um, you know, state, uh, state leadership, um, county leadership. Uh, there are basically our top elected officials in the state and they pay dues into <laughs> Uh, the Maryland Democratic Party, and historically we have been disproportionately reliant on those dues. Uh, we also have a trustee program uh, that's made up of corporations and individuals who uh, give uh, contributions at significant levels to help become sustainers of the Maryland Democratic Party. 
Um, we also hold fundraisers throughout the state uh, where we you know, seek to raise money uh, with events. Uh, we also seek online donations, and we're excited about that because we're really trying to expand our low dollar uh, donation program. I mean, when you see the aggregate donations that can go into some of these campaigns with you know, five and ten dollars across many people, and they're sustaining you know, cam major campaigns with millions of dollars, you know, we realize that we can do that uh, at the state party level and even, frankly, at the local level. Um, and so we're really trying to grow our small dollar program. Um, uh, telephone solicitations we get. Um, the DNC has a small program that we participate in where they make phone calls throughout the state um, to solicit support for the state party. Uh, and then we sell technical services like our voter access network, uh, our uh, texting program, Hustle, and Mobilize America, a platform for volunteers. So we sell technical services to candidates uh, and also um, a new thing that the Ben will be sharing is a data sharing arrangement with the DNC that may generate some significant resources. So with that, I'd love to turn it over to Ben to share with you our PowerPoint presentation. And thank you to Dave for clicking through this with me. Uh, so if we can just go to the first slide. Is it, there we go. So we just wanted to start by giving a brass tax breakdown on what uh, the composition of the Maryland Democratic Party is and how that relates to the DNC. Uh, so the DNC is comprised uh, of all of the state party chairs across the country and their first vice chairs, as well as at-large DNC members that are elected uh, by the uh, statewide central committee uh, to four-year terms. Uh, so Maryland has four at-large DNC members, Yvette Lewis, Greg Pecorero, uh, Belle Leong Hong, and Glenn Middleton, uh, who represent you at the uh, federal level. Uh, and it's very similar to how the Maryland Democratic Party is made up of county central committees, uh, those DNC members that I just mentioned, as well as our diversity leadership councils. And we're very happy to have Aruna Miller here as our Women's Diversity Leadership Council Director. Uh, and both of those uh, bodies are set up with very similar leadership structures. You have an executive committee of officers that are elected by the full uh, committee as a whole. Uh, you have working committees like rules committees and credentials committees that make up both bodies and then you have the membership uh, of those diversity leadership councils uh, that are led by the directors. Uh, so if we can go to the next slide. So the, the question is what do the Maryland Democratic uh, Party uh, staff members and officials uh, spend their time doing? Uh, everything that we do mission-wise is focused on electing Democrats at all levels, and it looks like the picture might have cut something off there, of office. Uh, and you might recognize uh, the uh, woman in the picture there, Samantha Hubbard, who is a Montgomery County native uh, and resident who spent a lot of time uh, organizing with the local central committee here. You might have attended a band training with Sam. Uh, so as uh, the chair mentioned, we focus on raising money, uh, and that money goes to uh, these year-round organizing efforts that we're really focused on right now, we've already hired three regional organizers who have uh, done about 7,000 uh, outreach attempts to uh, voters around the state thus far this year, and that's gonna continue to scale. Uh, we also identify and test issues and messages, so I'm sure most people in this room have spent time canvassing and phone banking, uh, asking whether voters support a candidate, asking them what issues matter to them, uh, and that's all information that goes into our voter files so that when it's time for the general election, we can turn over that much more valuable uh, data to our candidates that make it that much easier for them to know who they're talking to, how to talk to them, uh, and who's gonna show up for them in the election. Uh, we also recruit and train volunteers. So those 7,000 uh, voter contact uh, attempts that I was talking about earlier uh, were driven by 298 volunteer shifts that have already taken place uh, this summer and our organizers are calling and recruiting those folks and training them on voter contact methods so that two months, three months before the general election, they're not doing that for the first time. They've built that muscle up. Uh, they're comfortable on the doors. They're that much more efficient and as such can talk to that many more voters. And of course, as I mentioned, we contact voters. Uh, and as the chair mentioned, we actually manage the voter action uh, network and improve campaign technology. Uh, Mobilize America is something that we're gonna be able to offer candidates for the first time ever. It's something that presidential campaigns have historically used, uh, but we at the state party think it's something that our state and local candidates should be able to utilize and work hand in hand with the party on. Uh, texting services like Hustle have been uh, offered historically. 
uh, but there's some other great vendors that are moving the, the ball forward on those kind of technologies. So we're actually going to be offering two or three texting services to candidates and uh, allow them to uh, kind of create a bespoke uh, set of services that matches their needs and their volunteers' uh, preferences going forward. So uh, how does all this happen? Uh, what's the oversight like? Well, uh, the chair, uh, my Rocky Moore Cummings, sets the party's vision, and then we have uh, a team of 10 now staff members that execute on it every day. Uh, we've got a communications director, a data director, uh, a digital director, a fundraising director, an operations director. Uh, we've got three regional organizers out in the field and myself, uh, the executive director. Uh, so the chair works uh, with the executive committee, which meets six times per year, uh, and we do updates uh, on uh, our progress. We talk through new business. Uh, we have Susie Kaplan, one of the members of the executive committee here, uh, as well in the audience, uh, Arthur uh, as well. And uh, they are representatives, uh, be they chairs of the four big counties in the state. You get three members, not just your chairs, uh, that uh, represent you uh, to the statewide meetings. Uh, we also have the full uh, central committee that meets twice per year. Uh, again, it's updates and new business. It's a group of about 400 members. Uh, we've got our next meeting coming up in late October. Uh, and then you have the county, uh, county central committees that hold meetings to govern county activities, uh, and that takes place on a monthly or bi-monthly basis, depending on the county. Uh, and all of this is governed by a set of bylaws, uh, and the local committees have their own bylaws, but they have to be uh, in accordance with the state bylaws. And you can find all of those on our website, mdgems.org, uh, because we want to obviously make sure the rules are accessible, everybody knows them, everybody uh, can, can play by them. So. Uh, we were very excited. You probably got the email uh, to announce the We Vote, We Win campaign. Uh, it's going to be the name of our coordinated campaign for the 2019-2020 cycle. Uh, we're focused on a couple key components with that campaign. Uh, one is making sure that we're treating our diversity leadership councils and our central committees as the locus of organizing and volunteer recruitment and voter contact uh, instead of building a coordinated campaign that kind of operates around or in tandem. Uh, with them. What we want to spend our time doing is scheduling uh, voter contact with the local committees, uh, relying on those local committees to help perform the contact, but also do the recruitment because you have credibility. You know your neighbors. Uh, you uh, go a lot longer than a, an organizer that they've not talked to before in making that volunteer ask of them. Uh, and we actually have a field and data committee that's met a couple times. Montgomery County is very well represented on it. I believe you have four members on it now. Uh, sir. Uh, that uh, do a, a lot of work uh, building out precinct programs and setting best practices that have been promulgated to the local committees as well. Uh, that's focused on this data collection that we were talking about. Uh, but it's also focused on building infrastructure in places that were not traditionally strong. Uh, so the chairwoman's been very uh, focused on making sure that we don't leave rural Maryland behind. Uh, oftentimes we think about uh, the Democratic Party as really existing in four or five big voter-rich areas, and then everything else in the state is a sea of red. But when you really break down the numbers, you see there's a lot of blue dots uh, in that sea of red in places like Hagerstown and Salisbury uh, that we have majority Democratic registration, and we can have Democratic leadership if we just take the time to invest in them, teach them how to do targeting, teach them how to do the canvassing, hit their win numbers. Uh, and that's something that we've already started on. Uh, our first organizer was on the Eastern Shore. We brought an organizer on for Western Maryland. Uh, and we're going to have a dry run in the Salisbury uh, mayoral and city council races uh, this coming cycle where we think we're going to get good democratic representation and have a majority democratic city council there. Well, we're also focused on voter registration, of course. Uh, we have a new program uh, that the chair was very uh, uh, interested in making sure that we incorporated into the party because, you know, just tabling at events is not necessarily the most effective or efficient way. You need to be able to go and meet people literally where they live the same way we do when we canvass or phone bank uh, to make sure that you're getting everybody, not just folks that show up at the farmer's market that day. So there's a technology called Register to Vote that uh, Florida and Texas uh, use in their elections because they have a lot of uh, populations that aren't necessarily regularly folded into and it often uh, times are uh, suppressed in the process, their voter registration. And uh, it's very similar to minivan. How many people in the audience have used minivan? 
Exactly. Um, you can pull it up on your phone. You can see exactly where uh, that uh, unregistered voter is. You can go knock on their door, uh, and you can stand there with them and walk them through the process that will get their registration submitted. And that way we know exactly how many people we've reached out to. We know whether that turned into a submitted application. Uh, we know how many days it will take if uh, we maintain X contact rate in order to roll through all the unregistered voters in a precinct. So it really equips us to be very intentional and not just give voter registration lip service, but give it uh, the kind of focus uh, resourcing that our normal voter contact uh, involves. Uh, and the other thing that the chair has had us really focused on is the consistency, uh, not building the plane at the same time that we fly it. Uh, so during the coordinated campaign, how many people were frustrated about, uh, I want to get involved, uh, but I don't know how to get involved, or I can't get yard signs, or uh, there's not literature being distributed. Now, if we start that a year and a half out the way that we are now, it's going to be a smoothly uh, running system by the time we actually get uh, two, three months out from the election. We're not uh, testing everything for the first time. The website's not being built out uh, for the first time. We've got a funnel and we have uh, trained leaders at a local level that know what they're doing and are established points of contact. So that's uh, definitely the focus. Uh, who are we talking to? If you've heard Sam's presentation, and I recognize several people in the room who have been to those presentations, uh, you've heard this uh, before. But this is a population of about 580,000 people around the state uh, with targets in every county, uh, targets uh, from every uh, demographic community uh, that we've built out on the basis of literal precinct by precinct analysis from last time around to try and figure out where we dropped the ball. Uh, so there are the Hogan Democrats, and these are people who show up to every single election, but they don't always necessarily vote Democrat. Uh, there are liberal unaffiliated voters. Uh, one of the things that the, the chair has focused on is looking at where the voter growth is. And unaffiliated voters, the most rapidly growing population of voter registration by far in the state. Uh, in fact, by 2024, with the growth models that we're using, it looks like uh, unaffiliated voters and Republican voters combined will be equal to or greater than the number of Democratic uh, registrants that we have in the state. And the problem we run into is that the Republicans, uh, Hogan in particular, vastly overperformed the Democrats with these unaffiliated voters. And so what we need to do is start aggressively reaching out to them. And we have scores that we get from the DNC that allow us to see who in this unaffiliated voter population is likely to be a liberal voter and engage them early and often. And of course, there's the low turnout Democrats. And these are folks who always vote Democrat when they show up, but they might show up in one out of every three elections. And we've got to strengthen that habit of voting uh, oftentimes that happens in places like uh, my uh, town of Baltimore City, uh, for instance, where we don't necessarily have competitive general elections in the same way, so folks might not show up for the same um, reason that somebody in a, a swing district like Frederick does, because really the election at a local level and oftentimes at a state legislative level, it's decided in the primary and then it's over. So we've got to make sure that we're actively engaging and doing turnout all the way through uh, the run-up to the primary and then the general election so that we have representation in these democratic rich areas. Uh, so these are the year-round uh, organizing regions that we've uh, built out uh, and we've done this on trying to balance the population and balance the sort of local culture so you have uh, you know Eastern Shore folks talking to Eastern Shore folks uh, each of the organizers that we've hired thus far has uh, had at least two uh, campaign cycles worth of experience uh, in their regions. Uh, they're from or live in the regions that they're organizing, so they have credibility there. They oftentimes know uh, the individuals that they're talking to from past efforts. They have established relationships with the local central committees. And it's a lot easier to say, uh, I know what uh, a Hagerstown voter is interested in or a uh, Washington County Central Committee member's needs are if I'm also a Washington County resident and a Hagerstown voter. And so we've really been focused on doing that instead of kind of bringing in, uh, you know, higher hands, so to speak, uh, during the general election. Uh, so we also have some key dates. Uh, you, can, you can go ahead. I'm sorry. Uh, you're good. Uh, that uh, we just want to make sure everybody has on their radar. Uh, April 7th is the last day that you can register to vote uh, going into the 2020 cycle. Uh, so make sure that you have your neighbors uh, registered to vote by then. That's for the primary election, obviously, not the general election. Uh, but we want folks to be participating in the primary, not just the general election. Uh, 
Uh, and if you're interested in participating in the convention process, uh, you need to apply to be a delegate uh, by January 24th, and you do that through the State Board of Elections. Uh, so want to make sure everybody knows well in advance uh, how to go about doing that. Uh, the back of, um, or that card right there that you see, uh, our uh, Affirmative Action Working Committee is actually going to be working with local central committees to distribute uh, to make sure that we're getting that kind of information out uh, to let people know how to participate in the delegate process. Some of the questions that our moderator, Karen, is going to, uh, I think, be asking us uh, focus on you know, explaining the convention, explaining how to participate in the convention, because that's always kind of been shrouded in mystery. And we're trying to make sure that everybody understands what that process is and has a fair opportunity to participate uh, in it this time around. So we're going to be uh, distributing uh, this information uh, to all of the local committees and um, making sure that they uh, have an opportunity to participate. So uh, how can you get involved? Uh, we actually have a very uh, cool new website and a cool volunteer platform. Uh, you can go to mddems.org right now and check it out on your phones. It's very mobile friendly. Uh, it's, uh, it's, a, it's called an Action Center, and it has all of our events listed there. You can RSVP through that page. The second you RSVP, you'll automatically get a confirmation uh, email that has all the uh, data in it. And then the organizers that we've hired always do confirmation calls now to make sure that uh, you're going to show up, uh, that you have any questions uh, answered in the process. That uh, goes a long way to making sure that uh, our turnout rates match our RSVP rates. Um, you can also submit local uh, events to it. Uh, so Mobilize America uh, is the platform that Beto O'Rourke used in Texas uh, for that Senate campaign that uh, shocked people by being way more competitive. Uh, than they thought it was going to be. And one of the ways he did that was with something called distributed organizing. And basically what that is, is if you've got a local uh, committee or a local um, organization that wants to do a canvas, you don't have to necessarily go through the party to do that. You can submit your event online. Uh, anybody who goes to our platform can put in their zip code, uh, and it'll take them to that event that you're running, and it will give them all of the information that you've submitted to us. Our volunteers will stu uh, still do conference calls, uh, to them, uh, so that way we're driving uh, your events and you can become a locus of progress and it allows us to scale in a way that we could never possibly staff up uh, to do on our own. Uh, so uh, I think we move into the questions section now if anybody has any questions. Okay. We're, I'm sorry, we're going to go on to the next, can, uh, next speaker and we'll hold off questions to the very end. But thank gotcha. you very much for giving us a really comprehensive view of the state party. Um, I just want to mention, in case some people in the room don't know what the State Central Committee is, the State Central Committee is made up of all the central committees from around the state. So Montgomery County Central Committee, uh, Prince George's Central Committee, uh, Frederick County Central Committee. So that is the body that we call the State Central Committee. Okay, our next speaker is Arthur Edmonds, who is an esteemed member of the Montgomery County Democratic Central Committee. But before I introduce Arthur, let me just introduce a couple of the elected officials that walked in um, just a few minutes ago. And one we know is State Senator Cheryl Kagan. Thank you for coming, Cheryl. And, and I'm sorry. Can I just do 30 seconds, 60 seconds max? <laughs> Promise? Yes, 30. 30. 30 seconds. It matters that we elect Democrats. Today, NARAL is celebrating the 50th anniversary of women's reproductive choice of NARAL. Climate change is on the front page. We obviously have a White House and serious problems. But Governor Larry Hogan today finally released $63 million in funding for Metro that is so important to Montgomery County. We need mass transit. We care about people who try to take public transportation to work. It's good for the environment and people need their jobs. Uh, it matters. Democrats supported the funding and our governor withheld it until there were a lot of threats, and he finally released it today. So let's all work together and make sure we're victorious. And I just want to say thank you to you, State Senator, for being one of those people who pressured him into giving us the, that money, as well as the state party and everyone around us. Every Democrat in the state. Um, we also have um, Sarah Wolak, who is here, who is a member of the Montgomery County Democratic Central Committee. Sarah, raise your hand. Great. Our next speaker is Arthur Edmonds, and Arthur is an esteemed member of the Central Committee. He has been extremely <laughs> active. He has taken a leadership role in several activities on the Central Committee. He has chaired 
the spring ball, the program book, the auction. He's chaired numerous activities. And he's a representative to the state party's executive committee. So he represents the Montgomery County Democratic Central Committee on the executive committee. And today he's going to talk to us about how important that role is. Arthur? Thank you very much, Karen. Um, thank you very much, Karen and Dan, and also Maya. Appreciate it. Uh, my presentation probably has been already touched on and briefly through some of the other discussions that have already taken place. I will try to fill in some of the uh, information that uh, hopefully will be beneficial and that you can get uh, some uh, additional uh, insight in terms of what the executive committee is made of and uh, what its role is in the uh, state party. It's basically, as uh, was mentioned, that it's part of the infrastructure and we cannot operate without the executive committee uh, in its current form. So starting out on the next slide is um, the county, the executive committee is made up of the representatives from the 24 political subdivisions in Maryland, which includes Baltimore City. And we vote on a weighted vote, weighted vote average, which means that um, Montgomery County, which I'll show you a little later in the uh, slide here, Montgomery County gets so many votes, weighted votes per number of members that we have. And also we have other members within the uh, executive committee that are appointed by the uh, chair at the approval of the executive committee. The role of the executive committee is to conduct the business of the party between the state central committee meetings. And it can adopt budgets, but it cannot remove any officers, members of the uh, Democratic State Central Committee or elect permanent officers. Basically, it uh, combines to operate in the interim, operate uh, the party in the interim from uh, 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 leading up to the state central committee uh, meetings, which is where all the members from across the county, across the state, are represented on the uh, state central committee. We, con we conduct business based on a quorum, and you need 51 percent of the membership uh, present in order to conduct the business. And we had a meeting last night, which uh, where the first thing we acknowledged is that do we have a quorum? And if there's a quorum, then we are able to conduct business on behalf of the executive committee, on behalf of the state central committee, uh, within the executive committee. And we have meetings at least six times a year. And there are sometimes special meetings that are called. And also members of the committee can also, the executive committee can also petition to have a special meeting and can get at least 25% of members to uh, vote for that special meeting. Members are chosen uh, for the members of the executive committee for Montgomery County, which I am a part of the, uh, which I've already mentioned, I'm a part of the executive committee. We've got Susan Kaplan, which uh, is here, also uh, Erwin Rose and Jennifer Posey. Erwin is part of the platform committee, platform committee, and Susie is a part of the platform and voter registration engagement committee. I am a part of the rules committee, and in my past, I've also served on the credentials committee. I've been around the percentage committee now for about four terms. This is my fourth term, so I've served in various capacities within the um, uh, executive committee. And there are two standing committees on the executive committee, and those have already been mentioned. One is the rules committee, and the other is credentials. And there are also other committees that are established and can uh, be set up based on the discretion of the chair. This is the weighted vote that is uh, allocated through this uh, throughout the state of Maryland, uh, various counties in Baltimore City. You may not be able to see the numbers. If you page to the next one, this is Montgomery County. As you can see, uh, this may be, uh, slide may not be as current, but this is the last one that was published. Montgomery County has 24 members, and we have the highest vote in terms of the weighted votes that are cast at the uh, state central committee. Prince George's is next uh, with uh, 24 members and in total Montgomery County has 187 out of a thousand weighted votes. Prince George's have 185. I point out those two Montgomery County and Prince George's because with those uh, consolidated votes we can influence issues and, uh, and outcomes at the state uh, the state central committee, if we combine forces in order to 
uh, cast our vote toward a particular issue that we are interested in. If you go to the next slide, one of the things which we were able to do, uh, Chris George's, Chris George's had a uh, delegate to the DNC that they were pushing, uh, that they wanted to have elected. They kept our approach Montgomery County and we combined both to get that person elected to the DNC. The subsequent year to that, uh, we had a person which we were interested in getting elected to the, to the DNC and we combined with Prince George's and we were able to get that person elected to the DNC and that person was held in zero. So uh, with combined influence here outside the Washington metropolitan area, we can enact a lot of influence at the state party. When we, when we combine our efforts with Prince George and we have common interests. One of, the issue, one of the things which we just recently voted on at the executive committee, which um, we voted on a number of different things, but one of the things which I've already been touched on is the delegate selection plan. And that is the plan in which how uh, persons will be selected to attend the Democratic National Convention. And more information will be pre uh, presented on that particular uh, topic as the year unfolds. We had some discussion last night and have some outreach effort going forward to make sure that people are informed in terms of what they need to do in order to apply. We want to make it as an open process as possible so people are aware as to how they are to apply to be a delegate. The next meetings that we have for the executive committee meetings are in November and the school state party uh, meetings in October. So we leading up to the state party meeting, the state central committee meeting, there may be some additional issues which we need to address or vote on before going, going to the uh, state central committee meeting. And we've got October meeting or consolidate uh, or, or clarify any issues before we go to the uh, state central committee meeting. At that point, that concludes my presentation. If you have any questions, I'll be more than very happy to answer them after we hear from the other speakers. Thank you, Arthur. Our next speaker is also an esteemed member of the Montgomery County Democratic Central Committee, Marie Mapes. And Marie has dedicated herself to grassroots activism. And she's proven that in the fact that she chairs the Montgomery County Democratic Central Committee Voter Engagement Committee. And their role is to canvas door to door, to phone bank, and to generally recruit volunteers in general. Marie is going to talk about her role in the 2018 coordinated campaign, which was pretty exciting. And the coordinated campaign is the entity that comes together during a major election year. In 2018, it was the gubernatorial campaign, the state legislative campaigns, the council campaigns. And in 2020, of course, it will be led by the presidential campaign and the state party will organize this entire entity. Marie? Karen, I um, let me come back a little bit and tell you how I got involved uh, in the Central Committee in general, and then how that then ended up building into uh, my role in the coordinated campaign. Um, so I think, uh, like a lot of people, um, I uh, my involvement uh, in politics started from conversations with neighbors, um, and uh, particularly out of the. Um, the angst and, uh, and hard um, anxiety that came out of the uh, um, 2016 election. And my next door neighbor and I um, you know, found each other uh, as kindred souls, even though he was a Bernie supporter and I supported Hillary Clinton. So we were um, able to come together. One day, he leans over the fence in our backyard, clink, and says, Marie, would you like to be a precinct official with me? And I said, I don't even know what a precinct official is. Tell me more. Um, and so we uh, we dug in deep and found out, um, kind of like you all are doing, like educating yourselves about how the party works. And uh, I discovered that the precinct organization in Montgomery County was exactly what I was looking for in terms of being able to have those neighbor-to-neighbor -neighbor connections um, at, uh, and then having it connected to the power of the Democratic Party. Um, it was the grassroots arm of the party, and I was so excited to learn about it that when I found out that there was a vacancy on the organization that led the precinct organization uh, on the Central Committee, 
uh, I applied to, to be considered to, to sit on there and was able to get seated um, as a, a, a new representative of the Central Committee. And this was around uh, the summer of 2017. And so what then happened was that I found out about the Maryland Democratic Party's um, uh, interaction with the Central Committees in the different uh, counties where they were working on having this off-cycle field program. So like what uh, um, uh, uh, Maya and, and Ben were talking about, there was a, sort of the first effort to, uh, the, proto the prototype effort, I would say, for what they were looking to continue now with a consistency of effort to build the party and connect with voters in between the times where we have to get out the vote for elections. So the, um, I dug in deep with this because I knew that I wanted to be, um, I wanted to help organize within uh, Montgomery County um, so that we could have the connection between the, the precinct organization um, and uh, the, the voters who we were trying to find out what their important issues were um, and then connect them to their own power of being able to vote for Democrats. Um, so that was where I also found out that the various different grassroots organizations that were operating in Montgomery County were doing a lot of things that were cutting edge and were extremely effective. And so a lot of the effort that we did in the precinct organization um, in being able to go out and canvas um, in Montgomery County to connect with our voters, you, we saw where our grassroots organizations um, were really leading the way. And so to me, one of the things that I took back to the Democratic Party, um, infrastructure and leadership in the Central Committee was being able to take the best practices that we were seeing from grassroots organizations and bring it to our or own organizing um, in the party. And so because of those connectivity uh, that we saw um, uh, in this, in the off-cycle field program and then through the primary in 2018, moving into the general election, this is where the, the coordinated campaign started to, to, to come up and, uh, and be created. Uh, the, the, what I was seeing, um, and this is my own personal experience in, in, in this, was that uh, the relationships that the Central Committee um, through myself, through other people, had built with the, the different grassroots organizations that were um, around and active in Montgomery County, um, and then the, uh, um, the, just the other infrastructure that was out there in terms of the social infrastructure, like our democratic clubs. Um, that, that all was something that led me to come in the early fall um, of the, the coordinated campaign and you know, in a way that I have never done before in my life, uh, walk into the, um, the, the director of the coordinated campaign's office and say to him, please hire me, I need to help you because I know things that will be really beneficial for this campaign. And so they did, they hired me as a regional organization's coordinator, which was essentially working with the 150 grassroots organizations in Montgomery County to be able to connect it to the Democratic Party and do uh, as best we could coordination um, and connecting with our voters. And so we did end up turning out a lot of Democrats in that blue wave of the election. And I wanted to say that in the coordinated campaign, I think I'm supposed to speak to this, that uh, how that is organized is that um, the Maryland Democratic Party works with all the different candidates that are running in the general election, you guys covered a little bit of this, um, to pool together resources. And the Maryland Democratic Party in the coordinated campaign then hires the, the staff and um, is able to like put together campaign offices, um, buying materials, so like they are the ones who are making it possible for there to be a um, uh, uh, a coordination of all of those different candidates and, uh, and an economy of scale can happen um, where never, not, no candidate is on their own, um, but instead uh, that pooled resources, every, all of the ships can rise together. So um, this is particularly helpful in the campaign's finance side of things because 
Um, Maryland has some of the trickiest campaign finance in the, in the nation, um, and Montgomery County um, also has its public financing for campaigns, which made it extra complicated for this particular coordinated campaign. Um, this was a lot of what you were saying, building that ship as we were trying to sail it. Um, so I guess like the, the, um, the thought that I wanted to leave you guys with that uh, have come to this event to learn about what happens in the Maryland Democratic Party and our central committees and how we work together, what's really important, I think, um, in what I've experienced in, in, in my experience of working together was that being able to meet the people in the Maryland Democratic Party who are staffers, um, the, the DNC members, um, then being able to like make relationships with the central committee members, like these are the representatives of the Democratic Party. And the fact that you're interested enough to come to this event, this is, this is something that you could build those relationships um, with your Democratic Party representatives and be uh, ambassadors to be able to help build trust with other people who wouldn't come to this kind of event. So that built trust with the party um, where you can be a, a person who can speak to uh, the different representatives and, and be able to ground truth what's happening. Um, it's gonna be really helpful for us as we go through other campaigns together in the presidential election and the future gubernatorial. That trust is really hard to build and it's really easy to, um, uh, easy to have uh, dispersed. So I would say that if you are willing to help build that trust together, the relationships that you can, um, can build by getting to know these different members would be particularly effective in helping spread the word in a trusted way. So that was the piece of advice that I wanted to out there. Uh, so thanks for giving me a minute to talk. Okay, Marie, thank you very much. Our final speaker is Aruna Miller, and most people don't know that Aruna, Aruna started as a precinct official. She was a Democratic precinct official, then she was voted on to the Montgomery County Democratic Central Committee. And you may not know that when she was on the Central Committee, she started two programs, one that reached out to high school students to educate them on how important voter registration is. But she started a program called Serving Our Communities Committee, and that was really great for the party. What Aruna thought was you only go to your base community when you need them to vote, so how about going to them when they need our help? So she set up times for all of, all of uh, the Democratic volunteers to come to the treehouse, all the Democratic volunteers to come to the Montgomery County Coalition for the Homeless and Cook, time for all the Democratic volunteers to clean up Sligo Creek, and also to clean up outside of Long Branch Community Center. So she brought the Democratic Party to our base communities, and most people don't know how active she was as a Democratic Central Committee, but she created, committee member, but she created that program. As you also know, she was a member of the House of Delegates, and she also ran for Congress. So now she has a new assignment at the Women's Diversity Council. So why don't you tell us a little bit about your leadership assignment? Thank you so much, Karen. First off, I wanna thank every one of you Democrats that are here when you could be doing so many other things. So it is really inspiring to see this room filled with all of you. And I wanna thank Diana Conway for her leadership with the Women's Democratic Club and every one of you who also participates in the WDC. And to Karen Brito, let me tell you, um, Marie, much like your story, that you were inspired by an election that was deeply painful for many of us in this room. I too was inspired by an election, but it was another painful election, and it was in the year 2000 when Al Gore and George W. Bush ran. I was devastated from that election, and that's what triggered me to get involved with the Democratic Party slowly. And Karen Brito happened to be the chair, you know, moving forward when I did join. And let me tell you, she's been one of the greatest mentors for me, and I'm sure to countless other folks here in the state of Maryland. Her commitment, her humbleness is amazing. But she, and she ran a tight ship when she was the chair of the Central Committee, that's all I can say. And you know, for many of you, if you don't uh, realize this, 
Karen also served as a Maryland State Delegate for District 16. She often doesn't talk about it much, but she was a delegate for what, like six months or a year? I think it was like eight. Yeah, so, you know, please, so, uh, you know, if we can give it up for Karen Brito and her leadership. And also, of course, I'm gonna thank every one of the panelists that are here. So, uh, Karen talked a little bit about the Diversity Leadership Council. How many of you know what that is in the audience? That's great. So let me tell you a little bit about what the DLC is. The Maryland Democratic Party has um, the DLCs, and they're meant to be targeted to certain communities to make sure that we go ahead and engage them, get them active, have their voices heard. There are currently nine DLCs right now at the state level, and those nine DLCs target these communities, African Americans, Asian Pacific Islanders, Latinos, Continental Africans, LGBTQ, progressives, seniors, um, people with disabilities, and veterans. So we have those nine targeted DLCs. Now, after Maya Rocky Moore Cummings became the chair of the Democratic Party, she had a bold vision. She looked at the DLCs and she said, you know, something seems to be absent from these DLCs, and that is to be able to target on the largest demographic in the state of Maryland, in the United States, in the, in the world, which is women. She said, let's start a DLC that's gonna do a laser beam focus on women, and I am, proud to say that she reached out to me and, and appointed me to be the chair of the Women's DLC. And I am so excited to be able to be starting this initiative under her leadership for all women in the state of Maryland and for Democrats. Let me tell you why women are so important to the Democratic Party. Number one, in the state of Maryland, we have about six million residents, that's the population. We have almost four million registered Democrats in the state of Maryland. Now we know, I mean four million registered voters. Now we know that Democrats, as Ben talked a little bit about, almost outnumber Republicans two to one when it comes to registration. But then we have the unaffiliated voters. So of the registered voters in the state of Maryland, women represent 54% of the registered voters. When it comes to Democrats, women represent 59% right. of registered Democrats. And let me tell you something, in 2018, the voter turnout for Democrats, 69% were women. This is why we need to focus on women, we need to reach out more to them, we need to reach out to all diverse girls and you know adult women, and you know, in the many different communities, whether the diversity, you know, what it could be part of it racial, of course, that's diversity. It's also age. We want to make sure that we focus on younger audiences because we have a lot of older Democrats and older women that are the base of our party that do so much. But you know what? We need to, as someone said in the presidential uh, debates, pass the torch and get younger people engaged, involved, because they got the energy, they got the ideas, and really, we're leaving the party to them as we move forward in our nation. So we're gonna be doing all this. So um, I looked at this and I said, wow, you know, how are, how are we gonna be setting up this infrastructure to be able to do the women's DLC? Again, we're reaching out to the largest demographic group in the state of Maryland. So, you know, I looked at what we have at the federal level. We already have a structure, um, you know, set up with the eight congressional districts, right? That's how many eight U.S. Uh, representatives we have and the two senators. So I said, why don't we go ahead and set up an uh, infrastructure that will be based on these eight congressional districts? So we would have a female lead in every single one of those congressional districts. And along with her would be an emerging leader, a younger person, you know, so in the millennial age group, whatever, that would also be helping this individual as the director of the DLC in that particular congressional district. 
and they would go ahead and reach out to the rest of the geographical area that they're representative of. And of course, this includes multiple counties and areas. They can get as many volunteers as they want to be able to make this work for them. So the DLC is going to set up with the eight you know, uh, congressional leaders in, the, in a sense, but you know, congressional directors. Uh, in this case. And we also have an executive committee, which includes a secretary, a vice chair, and a treasurer. Now, I'd like to introduce you, who is in the audience, is the secretary of the Women's DLC, Mona Jaff Jaffe Rowe, who's sitting in the back. Raise your hand. No, there she, she can't quite stand up. She's got, um, she's wearing a boot on her foot right now. She's had an injury, but Mena's gonna be helping out. So anyway, so this is the effort. We are gonna go around around the state of Maryland, and we're going to be having a collective way of raising the voices of women, getting them inspired and engaged politically, and making sure that we have an influence on the Maryland Democratic Party and the policies that we set forward in the state through the legislature and you know, various levels. So that's what you know, the goal of the WDLC uh, is all about. And of course, we're going to partner with the WDC because they already have an awesome infrastructure here. And we'd like to take some of that and go to the various counties and try to implement a similar setup as well. So at this time, Karen, I'd be happy to answer any questions from the audience. OK, Fran is going to move the microphone around, and she is going to take questions. However, since a burning question is, how do you become a convention delegate? Well, I'm going to take the point of personal privilege as the moderator and ask that question of our state party reps. So it's very similar uh, as it would be for running for office. Uh, and I'm going to lay out one other uh, option uh, there in a second. But uh, you, as we talked about earlier, apply through the State Board of Elections uh, by January 28th uh, to be on the ballot. And they're elected at a congressional uh, district level. So you'll be voting for them uh, for the, the first congressional district or the second congressional district. Uh, each one is allocated a number of uh, convention delegates relative to their Democratic population and Democratic turnout. Uh, so Mount Montgomery County and Prince George's County have uh, more uh, representatives uh, available on the ballot to them uh, through their congressional districts, for instance, than the first congressional district does because there's just not quite as many Democrats on uh, the shore in uh, Carroll County and the other uh, constituent counties of the first congressional district uh, as there are for uh, places like Montgomery County, Prince George's County. Uh, you pledge yourself uh, to a presidential candidate uh, or you run as an unpledged delegate uh, when you go on the ballot. And when you apply through the State Board of Elections, they'll ask you whether you're going to be pledged to a candidate, and if so, who, uh, or you, know, you do have the option to run as an unpledged delegate. Uh, traditionally, uh, the candidates that perform the strongest pledge themselves to a presidential candidate uh, because voters tend to vote for the uh, delegates who uh, are supporting the candidate that they are supportive of. Uh, but you know, every now and then, unpledged delegates do get through. So you can campaign the same way that any uh, candidate for any other office can campaign. Uh, you can knock doors. You can do digital ads. You can um, you know, phone bank. Um, the Central Committee uh, is familiar with this process uh, through the um, uh, delegate selection plan that we uh, presented to the full body back in April uh, that they voted on and approved. It's also available on our website if you'd like to see all the nitty gritty details. Uh, but uh, I'm sure that Scott and your other uh, Central Committee members would be happy to talk offline with you about it and we at the State Party are always happy to uh, troubleshoot any questions that you might have as well. The other um, option uh, that you would have to, to be a convention delegate is those uh, at-large members uh, that were touched on briefly earlier, and they are voted on uh, by the full uh, state central committee uh, at its April uh, or May meeting, depending on when it gets scheduled uh, this year, but it'll be after uh, the primary, and so we get a couple extra members that the state central committee itself uh, gets to vote on. Uh, and those are at-large delegates. So uh, both uh, options are available to you. 
And if you have any more specific questions, I can talk to them. I'm sure everyone will have questions that they want to talk to you about individually. But thank you very much for that great explanation. Well, she who, whoop, is this on? She who holds the mic holds the power. That's what I learned as head of WDC. So I'm going to first thank this panel. I wanted this to happen for the same reason that we held the county um, It's Your Party session two years ago. I didn't know how this party, I mean, I didn't know how the party worked. And I so appreciate all of you coming and shedding some light on that, and particularly Karen who helped me organize. But here is my question. And it's probably for you, Maya, but you can all weigh in. The rise in unaffiliated voters, the, particularly the unaffiliated organizations that arose post-Trump, um, there are a number of them here in the county and across the state. They are progressive, but they are not affiliated officially with the Democratic Party. The fact that we now have um, new voting, or we're talking about new voting strategies such as ranked choice voting. Um, we have limits on the donations that can be made by candidates who raise money through public financing. So for example, they are limited in what they can donate to the party, isn't that correct? The public financing candidates? Yeah. Uh, that's correct. So for instance, uh, we have a special exemption that we came up with this year uh, for folks like the county council members in Montgomery County where we basically spot them banned for three years and they pay us for the four year cycle uh, during their election year, which is when they can actually raise and spend money. Oh. But the point is there are lots of changes, some of which are good in many ways, but they run the risk of undermining the power of parties. Can you speak to that? I mean, I'm a Democrat from the day I was born, and I want to stay a Democrat. I want the party to be there strong. You know, you know where I'm going with this. So as you all know, the 2016 election was, uh, you know, I think um, very contested. Uh, we had a situation where um, uh, it wasn't just a fait accompli in terms of uh, you know a, a candidate running and being the presumed winner. Uh, there was uh, Bernie Sanders who had a strong following, uh, and uh, when it came to the convention, you know there was just a lot of fallout uh, around everything from the, the rules and regulations of the DNC uh, to how the convention was conducted, uh, even you know a lot of contention between uh, delegates uh, of the various candidates. Uh, and I think that that caused a major infrastructural um, institutional challenge to the Democratic Party. Uh, you know, you had um, some people who were dissatisfied with the outcome, deciding not to vote for a Democrat, uh, to either stay home or to vote for a third party candidate. Uh, you had uh, Bernie Sanders supporters basically challenging the rules of the DNC and, and leading a internal effort to overthrow some of the rules that they felt uh, disadvantaged their candidate in the 2016 election. Uh, and so, you know, with that, I think that we're at a, um, a, a very, I think, I don't want to say destabilizing, I, I would m more argue a, a realignment, if you would, uh, in terms of um, how not only the party operates, but also the ideological positioning of the party as well. Now, um, and, and, and you're seeing that uh, in terms of the operations of the party and how people are viewing the party. There are some on the progressive left uh, who are viewing the party with deep suspicion. Uh, they don't trust it. You know, they had their experience in 2016. They, you know, they just view the party as something that they want to arms distance from. They don't want to be co-opted by it. Uh, and frankly, they want to challenge it, uh, be able to challenge it in very hard and heavy ways. I, I think that we're seeing that with the, the climate debate. Um, and, and so, you know, as a, as a political scientist, all of that, I think, is, is natural. Um, and is it healthy? Sure, why not? Uh, you know, democracy is all about contestation. Uh, and so to the extent that uh, we see a situation where um, uh, we're seeing, you know, the other party infrastructure being contested. I think that uh, that's a part of, you know, certainly people's First Amendment rights, uh, but also a part of change. Um, 
Ranked choice voting, on the other hand, is a completely different animal. Because I do think, um, and by the way, I'm not an expert yet, but I'm being exposed more and more to the argumentation around ranked choice voting. Um, and I would argue that that might be the death knell of party. Absolutely. Uh, from what I have heard so far and read, um, you know, ranked choice voting gets rid of primaries. Uh, it's everybody uh, is thrown into one pot, no matter what party you are. Uh, and then uh, on one ballot, you've got your Republicans, you've got your Democrats, you've got your Greens, you've got your Liberals, or whatever. Uh, and, and, and then you cast your, your choices, your top three choices, I believe, uh, for whomever. You know, it doesn't have to be, you know, confined to whoever your party is. Uh, and then, you know, I guess presumably some computer, you know, calculates, calculates uh, and runs the numbers and determines that, you know, who, you know, if there was not a majority winner uh, and you have a plurality sort of scenario where nobody reaches 50 plus one, uh, then, you know, then the computer then uh, goes back and finds, well, who were the second choices? Who were the third choices? And frankly, you know, whoever ended up being the second choice could actually leapfrog over and end up beating uh, the person who had the most votes uh, in the pl plural plurality scenario, which, which could be a Green Party person, which could be a Republican, which could be a Libertarian, which could be, it could be anybody. Uh, and so what you're going to have is a gaming of the system in ways that nobody is anticipating. And, and in this last, uh, when we went to, um, we went to New Mexico, the ranked choice voting people showed up uh, at the DNC meeting, uh, and they made a presentation about how great ranked choice voting was. And I asked the question, have any of you done any analysis or study about what this will mean for the Democratic Party? Because all you have to do is think it through and game it out. Uh, and you'll understand that that party then becomes unimportant uh, in this process. Uh, and, and, could, and eventually, uh, the party format could end up imploding. Now, you know, you might not care uh, about that, but I happen to as a chair of the Maryland Democratic Party. Questions? Wow. Or any other comments up there? Why don't you say your name? And those of you who know me know, ask a question, not make a speech. Thank you. Peggy Dennis, doesn't sound like it's working, it's on. does it? Okay. Yep. Uh, this goes to the core of grassroots organizing. Does our Montgomery County Democratic Central Committee have email addresses organized by precinct? And I ask that because I know from experience how time consuming it is to knock on doors of Democrats. Forget phone calling, because most people won't answer their phone calls. And sending out letters or invitations to a meet and greet is prohibitively expensive. So are we using emails and social media now? Is it more accessible to precinct organizers? Where we have um, email addresses, being able to have those organized in van so that you can pull whatever list there is um, in van is a, is a goal for the party, um, for the, the central committee. Um, and I would say that because email addresses are um, a resource that's considered very lucrative, um, it's something that is often used for um, being able to reach out and contact and ask for donations. That's information that can be very closely held. Now, I, I would say that we've been actually pretty cooperative with the, the Maryland Democratic Party to, to be able to share information and be able to empower our precinct officials, get that information into a place where they can be uh, able to access it. Um, and I think that in general, there's, there's, been, there's been a good sharing relationship on that front. Did you guys want to say anything? Oh, I, I was just going to co sign that and offer a little bit of context. Uh, one of the things that uh, the chairs had us really focused on is being more collaborative with the local central committee so that we can help scale their efforts instead of it just being on them to, to figure out themselves. So, uh, a great example of that is about five minutes before I came up here, uh, Dave Coons uh, let me know about a uh, debate and some activism that y'all have going on at a local uh, level around a polling location. Uh, you've got a petition going around, and he said, hey, can you help us get the word out about this? 
Uh, and so I think as long as the, the chair is okay, with, uh, we're going to be doing an email blast uh, for you in the next couple of days uh, to all of our uh, email addresses that are in Montgomery County to make sure that people are, are aware this is going on and can get plugged in with it. Uh, we've done the same thing uh, with your uh, local presidential uh, debate watch parties, uh, for instance. We've blasted that out to all of our Montgomery County email lists. Uh, and we also did a digital advertising uh, on Facebook, Instagram, and uh, Twitter uh, around it. So we're trying to be as collaborative as possible, uh, not just for our priorities, but for your local central committee's events. Yeah, for those of you who wonder, there was a vote and they voted against the 12 uh, early voting locations. But in the past, we have succeeded in turning out in large numbers and overturning those bad decisions. So yes. um, it's not over till it's over. Yeah. So is there someone else? Yeah, I wanted to add that uh, in terms of grassroots outreach, uh, one of the things which I want to make you aware of that each district here in the county, we are doing a dollars drive. So um, that's one way to come out and meet other folks within your district and also to contribute to help build party infrastructure here in the county. And also on October 5th, October the 15th, there will be a debate watch party at 8 p.m. at Fire Station in Silver Spring. So that's another opportunity to come out and meet some of your grassroots constituents and continue to build a party. One of the things uh, that the chair just reminded me there is the, uh, the Mobilize America platform that we have up on our website now, mvdems.org slash volunteer. Every time you RSVP for an event, your uh, email address goes on uh, uh, our file. Uh, and so one of the reasons that that's such an important volunteer funnel for us is it helps us get email addresses so that we can do the kind of outreach that you're talking about, not just for the party, but for the local central committee and for candidates uh, who are running for office as well. So uh, really, really encourage you not just to use the Mobilize America platform yourself, but anytime you're doing recruitment around events, uh, to make sure that they RSVP for those events uh, through that online platform because it makes it that much more uh, effective uh, and that much more efficient for us to do outreach going forward. Oh, uh, yes, uh, we can set your local uh, website up with a, a link that uh, directs to, to that page as well. I just wanted to ask a question. And I, I wanted to ask a, a question. Um, we've heard of voter suppression in Georgia. We've heard about you know, Russians uh, colluding to uh, you know, disrupt our elections. What is our party doing to help voter, you know, voter integrity of our elections? Because I think that's a concern for us. So we have a voter integrity uh, working group that we set up uh, because frankly, I, I have a platform that I basically ran and won on called Go Deep. Um, you know, everybody was talking about this blue wave and I said, look, you know, we can't, I mean, we did great down ballot, but we couldn't take the top of the ticket, which makes no sense in the state of Maryland. Uh, and so, you know, I said that we really need to go down to in deep into the ocean, into the floor of the ocean and just build from the ground up. Uh, and so the P in DEEP, because DEEP is an acronym, the P stands for Protect Our Vote. Uh, you know, all you know that there were 86,000 uh, voter registrations messed up at the Motor Vehicle Administration this last election cycle. Uh, that caused some people here in Maryland not to be able to vote in our last primary. Nobody at the time called it voter suppression, but the practical effect of it was. Uh, in Prince George's County, we had um, people standing in line, ready to do their civic duty to vote, and they ran out of ballots. Yes, yes. You know, nobody's saying it was intentional, but the practical effect of that was people were disenfranchised. They were not able to vote. Uh, and then we had a Russian oligarch, a Russian oligarch sitting on top of our voter election system here in the state of Maryland as a primary uh, investor uh, in a vendor we had hired uh, to run our election systems. Uh, and so, you know, while they have presumably cut ties uh, with that, uh, that particular company, uh, the fact of the matter is that we had already been warned uh, that Russians were actually uh, interfering in state and county uh, election systems. And so it appears that Maryland has already been targeted uh, in more ways than one. Uh, we also know that we've been targeted online through social media 
and the shaping of how people think here in the state. Uh, and so, you know, we are and remain very concerned about this. Uh, and so one of the first orders of business in terms of one of the working groups we created was the Voter Integrity Working Group, uh, led by Alex Garcia out of Baltimore City. Uh, and that group, and I think that, Susie, you were on that committee. Yes. And they have been hard at work uh, looking at the various issues, categorizing the issues. Uh, there is a recent letter that they have drafted that's very comprehensive that is about to go to the Board of Elections uh, that asks a lot of deep, deep questions uh, about um, the operation of the election coming up. Uh, even prior to that, um, this last election cycle, I mean this last um, session of, uh, of the state legislature, I, I wrote a letter uh, asking them to look at a couple of pieces of legislation that we might need in advance of the 2020 election. Uh, we're hoping that you know, if, if, if the legislature, if the House of Delegates and the Senate come back in for any kind of special session that they might consider doing some uh, some you know fixes that might help us uh, in, in advance, but I say all that to say that we absolutely. I mean, people seem to think that you know Maryland is a blue state. It's not. It's a purple state. But that's a different. Uh, they tend to think that you know we've got everything taken care of here in the state. And the fact of the matter is that we don't. We're vulnerable, uh, and so we're on top of this in terms of focusing on solutions and fixes. Uh, we've had members of this committee going to the Board of uh, Elections meetings uh, to keep abreast of what they're proposing. And so we are ready and prepared. Uh, Delegate Janelle Wilkins, ladies and gentlemen, just walked into the room. Hands and applause. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, so we are, you know, we're on top of it, um, but at the same time, we still feel, you know, behind the eight ball. So we've got to just uh, operate on all cylinders. Good. Hi, Linda Coco, former president of Women's Democratic Closer. Um, ben, I was very impressed with your presentation. I'm pleased to hear, as you said, there are pockets of Democrats in several of the counties. Do you think there's a shot to get rid of Andy Harris? <laughs> you gotta so, try. I mean, I, the way that I always respond to those questions, and this is like me going back to the old political consultant uh, role when uh, like a client or a potential client asks you, can I win? The, the answer is that it's always possible. The question is whether it's plausible, right? Yeah, sure. Uh, and so I think that we've taken a very uh, smart, uh, long-term approach to answering that under the chair's leadership. And uh, one of the things that we touched on in the presentation earlier is that it's not just about taking the congressional seat back. It's about getting democratic representation at a municipal level and in the state legislature there. We've only got one delegate uh, and left on the shore, and that's uh, Cherie Sample Hughes. Uh, and that's something that's frankly unacceptable, especially when you look at uh, counties like uh, Somerset that have uh, significant uh, minority populations that, that vote Democratic but have been historically suppressed. Uh, you have the largest city on the shore, Salisbury, is a majority minority. Uh, city and it just hasn't been leveraged uh, in a comprehensive campaign program uh, historically. And so what we're trying to do is to get uh, people involved in volunteering for municipal races and state legislative races and get uh, folks elected at those levels because one, it restores hope that you can get a Democrat elected and those are very winnable seats uh, in a way that the congressional district, it is a bit bigger lift. So I think we've got to do our short-term work of getting folks elected at the municipal and state legislative level. Uh, and that will restore hope and build a bench of candidates with name ID um, and create these engines of registration and turnout that make the numbers better for us. Uh, and of course, uh, we're looking forward to uh, supporting a, a congressional candidate against Andy Harris. We obviously can't be involved in the primaries. We have to uh, let that play out. Uh, but what our job is, is to build a machine for them so that they're not starting from scratch once they make it through uh, the primary. So uh, we've had an organizer working with central committees uh, to do voter outreach, uh, to identify issues that matter to them, like we know uh, infrastructure and healthcare are probably the two biggest issues on the shore right now because we've had thousands, literally thousands of voter contact attempts and over a thousand IDs 
uh, over the last couple of months there, and that's something that we can equip uh, our candidate with. And I think it's gonna make them a much more uh, effective voter. I didn't see uh, the last congressional candidate there who did run a very good campaign, I don't mean this as a critique, but didn't talk about infrastructure because he hadn't necessarily been equipped to know that infrastructure was something that matters to people there because it's not like a sexy, obvious issue, but our contact showing us that that's something that people want to hear about. Uh, so I, I think that it's, it's a long-term effort. I think that we uh, definitely will do better this cycle than last cycle and the cycle after that uh, will hopefully be an improvement as well. Uh, but we've got to do the building blocks in order to make sure that that's possible. I never want to set, uh, I don't ever want to overpromise. I always want to underpromise and overdeliver. Uh, and so that's what we're trying to do here. Another quick question. The, um, in years past, the Maryland Democratic Party offered some excellent webinars on ban and et cetera. I'm assuming you're going to do that again. So we still have those going on monthly now, uh, and they uh, are actually uh, available on our website. Uh, you can go to the, uh, the services section of it. Uh, so I encourage you to check that out. Uh, Samantha Hubbard, who I mentioned earlier, uh, who uh, works very closely with the Mount Montgomery County Central Committee, I know uh, you all know her well, uh, offers those. She actually did one this morning. Um, and uh, we're also doing comprehensive regional uh, training summits, though. Uh, so we did one up in Baltimore, uh, in May that had over 100 folks come out. Uh, I know the RSVP count was around 165. I think the turnout uh, was a, obviously a little bit less than that, but it was over 100 folks. Uh, we've got one coming up in Frederick on October 5th, and the RSVP count's around 70 right now. And we've been trying to move them around the state to make sure that more people have an opportunity not just to attend and to benefit from them, but to build this network of potential volunteers and supporters as well, because a lot of it's the community building in places that aren't uh, traditionally as democratic as uh, Mount Montgomery County or Baltimore City or Prince George's. Um, and they're really soup to nuts training. Uh, they focus on the fundraising, they focus on uh, obviously van, uh, voter targeting, what canvassing looks like, uh, communications. Uh, and we think that it's gonna equip a lot more people to run for office and to run competitively for office. Uh, we also uh, do all of those for free uh, so that there's no barrier to participation. Uh, and so that's something uh, that uh, we've been very focused on. And uh, at this point, each, I think we're only missing three, uh, each central committee has had a van training or uh, the three that we haven't uh, trained yet have been scheduled uh, for the next couple of weeks. So we've been trying to make sure that uh, everybody has access in that respect as well. Go look at Gabe Acevedo, ladies and gentlemen. Just walked into the room. Hey, give a shout out. My, my uh, central committee rep. Where, where's Pam? Oh, yeah. Got a new hairstyle, Pam? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't recognize her at first either. So, hi, I'm Haley. Um, and my question is kind of for this side of town, but anyone can feel free to speak to it. So. Given the amazing amount of youth engagement in politics and in activism and grassroots movements right now, um, I'm wondering how the committee and the party is reaching out to these youth movements, especially given that they are extremely involved in voter turnout, but also very educated on like party issues. And I'm thinking particularly of the Sunrise Movement sitting outside the DNC and calling for climate debate and learning how to work these kind of party issues and infrastructure. Um, so I'm wondering how you guys are reaching out to pe young people, college students, high school students, and trying to get them involved. Okay, hot button issue. <laughs> But I just want to preface this by saying that I, my first book that I ever wrote was called The Political Action Handbook, A How-To Guide for the Hip-Hop Generation. I have been for the last several years intending to write the second edition of that book, which um, would be the, uh, the Political Action Handbook, A How-To Guide for the Next Generation. Um, and, and I so very strongly believe in youth uh, participation in our politics. Um, it's been an area that I have done a lot of work on. And so I'm actually excited. I'm excited to see uh, youth leading the effort around gun violence. I'm excited, super excited to see youth leading the effort around climate change. I think what it's brought for us is the understanding that um, young 
people are really kind of focused around issues, not necessarily parties, but around issues. And because the Democratic Party is actually in the right place in, in, in these areas, the, the issues uh, then typically align with Democratic Party politics. Um, and so for us, you know, I just asked uh, the team, um, what was it, a month ago, two months ago? Um, we're about, I'm about to do a, a, a college tour. So I've already done a tour of the state in terms of 24 political jurisdictions. Uh, I'm about to go to every college campus and talk to young people. Uh, on the Eastern Shore, we have a young lady who has just become the head of the Maryland High School Democrats. Uh, and so we, I first encountered her on my 24 jurisdiction tour, uh, where she came uh, and uh, was really a, a participant in one of our, um, uh, our discussions. Uh, and then she just kept showing up at our events on the Eastern Shore. Uh, and then she really became uh, active and recently uh, got elected uh, to a statewide position uh, in the high school Democrats. Uh, and so, and we're also looking at um, actually uh, Delegate uh, Miller, uh, we're looking at how we can actually um, systematically organize this high school effort. Um, and for, for me, it's just like, you know, the, I don't know if every high school is going to be welcoming of the Democratic Party stepping through the door. So we have to be careful about how we approach this. But um, there, are, there are huge opportunities, I think, uh, particularly around high school students. Um, so, you know, that's where we are right now. There's a lot of work to be done. Oh, one additional thing is that I insisted that we also create a youth working group. Uh, so we, um, and if you want to join that, we're happy to have you because we're just constituting it. Um, it's, that stood up about a month ago. It's good. Um, and so we would love for you to join it. Um, but basically, they're going to be the youth DLC, if you will, but they won't have the DLC title for political reasons. That's a different story. Um, but um, the, the challenge for the youth working group is to come up with a statewide plan for youth mobilization and to execute. Good. Great. I, I just want to piggyback. Sorry, go ahead. So to, to make that concrete also, one of the things that I, I feel like a lot of young Democrats that are trying to get involved and get opportunity in the workforce uh, run into is they're not paid. And one of the first things that the chair did when she uh, came into office was create a paid internship program for the state party so that more people would have access uh, to that kind of opportunity because obviously not everybody can afford to work a free job. Uh, and so I just would really like to, to give credit where credit's due uh, there. Um, one, you can clap. <laughs> And uh, as, as a millennial, uh, I'd also like to say uh, she uh, brought me in uh, to work for the party. So it's something that we're not uh, just doing from an outreach uh, standpoint. I mean, she has uh, lived those values in terms of uh, the staffing as well. Yeah, I also wanted to add, uh, Haley, that's a great question. And I got to tell you, when um, you know Chair Rocky Moore Cummings reached out to me to start the women's uh, DLC, she said, you got to make sure that you reach out to young people as well. And I said earlier that that's what we're trying to do with all the various throughout the state, the setup, the infrastructure will be. And activists, of course, you have to be a registered Democrat, paired up with the emerging leader, someone that's younger. So you will learn from people that have been the boots on the ground, that have been here for a long time, and help guide where we're going to go next. Now. Uh, I, I forgot to mention that we're going to be doing a launch party for the women's DLC sometime in December. And the location so far that we selected is actually going to be at the University of Maryland because we want to be able to attract as many young people and students as possible to get them to sign up, to get engaged. We're going to have a lot of keynote speakers there. So I want to say, you know, we will be sending invitations out once we solidify the details. Every one of you is welcome to come. And please bring other people. They can crash the party. We love party crashers, so talk to come. As many people as possible, and young people too. And you know, as um, the chair said, it's about the policy issues that you all stand for. From what I understand now, it's not the labels, whether you're a Democrat or progressive, whatever. It's about the issues. And we're going to try to put that focus into the women's DLC as well. So thank you for that great question. I wanted to, to hop in just as well. Um, there were a couple things that I didn't hear people say that probably would be relevant for you all to know. Um, the, 
the, the, the official positions in the, in the party um, that are available for students, um, I haven't heard mentioned yet, but in the Central Committee, there are two reserved spots for students. Um, and I think that we're actually voting on those next meeting, aren't we? To, to, yeah. to fill those again. So um, I, um, actually Scott might know that, uh, whether the, the advertisement has gone out in some November. fashion. November. It's in November that we're voting on those. Okay, So you thank can you. get elected to that and then tell your family at Thanksgiving. Uh, <laughs> and they would be so proud of you as they're digging into their turkey, <laughs> exactly. So there's a, there are official positions. I don't think there's actually an age limit on like whether you can be a precinct official as well, like within your uh, precinct. Um, and uh, so there are actually official positions in the Democratic Party. Where I've seen there's, um, the other thing I didn't hear uh, mentioned was that uh, we often sign off, I personally have signed off on hundreds of uh, SSL hours um, for people to be able to, to come in as students and do um, uh, different kinds of eligible activities that uh, that um, that students can come in and get like credit for, um, and there are some things that they're able to do, some things that they're not able to get credit for. Like for instance, it says explicitly on the form that knocking on doors and making phone calls is not part of the things that you can get SSL hours. But there's so much work in building the party that are not those things as well. Um, and uh, I, the last thing that I'll mention is that when we've done outreach to, to high schools, like there was a, um, an activism night that we were invited to, to go to at Wooden High School um, and, uh, and table there and like, you know, go and represent. Like the thing that I heard from students often um, when we were talking to them about things they were interested in that the party was doing was candidate training. They were really excited about the, the Maryland Democratic Party um, candidate training, and, and that type of training is, is for candidates, but also for people who want to be staff on um, uh, on uh, campaign. Thank you. <laughs> sure. um, so staff on campaigns too, which is a great way to get in, uh, get experience, um, possibly paid experience even, um, to, to be able to work. Um, and that was so. In any case, like. The getting the trainings, these free trainings that are available, I think is one of the most um, one of the most exciting ways for students to get uh, and young folks to get um, get training. We also have a, a Montgomery County Dem Young Democrats Club as well, so yeah. there are different leadership positions like available at various different ones. So you're about to say something. Scott. Something Marie just said made me think about this. So one of the things. Uh, that I realized very quickly is that a lot of times candidates or first time candidates will come to us and be like, who should I hire? Like, how do I get a hold of somebody who knows how to do a campaign? Uh, and then, you know, we have people come to us looking for jobs as well. Uh, we actually started a resume bank uh, that we're collecting anybody uh, who's uh, a political staffer that's looking for work will hold your resume so that when candidates come to us, uh, we've got a ready reservoir of folks that we can plug them in with. Before we leave the topic of youth, Paul Ellis has joined us. He's the head of democracy, he's the organizer for Democracy Summer. And, uh, thank, you. thank you very much. I'll just um, thank the panel for being here. Uh, I just wanted to add a small thing to this. Um, first of all, in Montgomery County, we have a ton of young people who are involved in activism on topics like climate and gun prevention. And so, with the Raskin campaign and the Congress of the Democracy Summer program. We're in really close touch with the students who organize those groups. Some of them were in the program this summer. And so what we've done and what the state party's also done, uh, and I commend them for it, is to take the attitude that we can provide support to them in their activities and not, not necessarily be dictating what they should do. Um, I find the students that I meet want to be taken seriously. They want to be treated like they are mature, and so we try to do that. You know, we try to, that's not for um, I would also say that uh, we're blessed in the state of Maryland to have a law that says that young people can register to vote at 16, even if they cannot vote until they're 18, except to become a part where they can vote in local elections. Um, <laughs> So there's a lot more young people that need to be informed of that. Um, and the last thing I would say is a lot of them are unfamiliar with the party structure. They're a 
are familiar with the procedures, who to contact, what the deal is. And I think the biggest thing to communicate is what is a party but made up of its members? Like, who, who is the party? It's your neighbors, it's your friends, people who are deeply involved in your community at a local level. As the panelists were all involved in their special committees, and um, that's the biggest thing to convey that this is not a nebulous, distant, vague body. It's something they're invited to, and we hope they crash. My name is Scott Weber, I'm a Montgomery County activist, and we've got a couple of leading questions. One having to do with, say, infrastructure that's in Salisbury, and another one about what the youth are involved with as far as issues. Could I have the party uh, representatives speak to messaging and the efforts that the Democratic Party is doing in messaging? We've heard a lot of mechanisms for organizing, for getting involved in the mechanics of it, but could you speak to the message of the Democratic Party so that we want to convey this is what it means to be a member of the Democratic Party there's something to be said in how it's targeted towards, let's say, efforts in um, Oakland or efforts in um, Ocean City. Was that a planted question? <laughs> <laughs> because we've been laser focused on this, and I would say we're laser focused on it in two ways. Um, one, we just finished a, um, the, the draft. Actually, we just completed um, what will be the first of many. Uh, we'll have a longitudinal survey going out. Um, and it's gonna be county level across the state uh, so that we can understand what the issues are, so that we can pull test um, you know, messages uh, with, uh, with people on the ground. Uh, and so this survey will be deployed. It's literally going out like in uh, the, the coming week. Yeah. So in that, um, we've got draft messages that will be tested. Um, eventually, you'll start to see messaging, and you'll know that that messaging came from is evidence-based, uh, that it was deployed in the field. We got feedback. We were able to shape the language based on how people thought about, um, about the language. Uh, the, the other, so polling and surveys uh, is one part of it. The other part of it is for the first time ever in the history of the Maryland Democratic Party, we are developing a party platform for the state. And that was a part, that's the D in deep, uh, define our values, um, because we had a lot of people who were concerned uh, that they weren't sure where the Maryland Democratic Party stood. Uh, and so we determined that we were going to define our values, and we're doing that through a party platform development process. Uh, the party platform committee is actually already there, hard at work, uh, and you know soon you'll be seeing, seeing some outward. We just deployed for all the delegates in the room and the, and the elected officials. We just deployed a survey in the field for for uh, elected officials. Uh, we ask that you complete that. Um, we're going to be sending it to your personal email addresses in, in addition to the official email addresses. We understood the official email addresses might have gotten spammed. Um, but it's, it's a multi-phase process that will include input from people around the state. Again, evidence data-driven. Uh, and uh, we'll hope be hosting uh, open hearings around the state as well. Uh, eventually we'll be adopting a party platform, and, and that will be another major uh, messaging platform for the party. Great. Um, we just want to summarize, I'm sorry, sorry, we're just going to summarize some of what you've heard today, and we've heard some pretty exciting things. The first thing we heard was that the Democratic National Committee provides technical assistance, some of it financial, limited financial, and data and technology assistance to the uh, state parties. We also heard that people don't understand why infrastructure is so important. And infrastructure basically provides the ecosystem which makes the party run. And obviously, you need resources for that ecosystem. So thank you to Women's Democratic Club again for your check this evening. There is a couple of um, really revolutionary things that um, were mentioned too. The fact that there were 298 volunteer shifts this summer and that people will be trained a year before the election so that they don't have to be trained again during the election so you'll repetitively keep activists and you'll keep activists busy. So that's something that's never done before. So thank you for the state party for that. That's pretty revolutionary. 
Um, we like the new slogan for 2020, We Vote, We Win. Um, the com and the coordinated campaign will be working with the diversity councils and the central committees, and the central committees will play a key role in voter contact. Um, we also heard that, we're, that the state party is very active in some of the local races, particularly Salisbury, where we're hoping that uh, we'll have a majority council there. And I know some of you in the room have already told me that you're volunteering in Salisbury, so that's great. Um, some of the other things we heard is that we have a very large number of unaffiliated people so that the state party has a campaign out to talk to and message to affiliated voters. One interesting we heard, thing we heard was that at some point in time that the unaffiliated in the state will outpace pace the Democrats and Republicans combined. So that is a concern, so thank you for addressing that. I, I, okay. The uh, Republicans plus the unaffiliated will equal the Democrats. Sorry about that. Yeah. Sorry. No. Okay. Um, we also heard that they have a new um, volunteer, plat volunteer website platform called Mobilize America, which will be great. <laughs> and we also heard that um, the grassroots groups have fed into the coordinated campaign and People who were involved in the grassroots groups <coughs> play a large role. So if you are involved in a grassroots group, you can bring those resources to the coordinated campaign because the presidential will need it. Um, you can be, as the term was used, ambassadors to build trust with the party. We have um, diversity councils now, nine new diversity councils, which is great, um, first time ever. Um, and a Women's Leader Diversity Leadership Council, definitely first time ever. Um, women represent 54% of the voters. Registered Democratic women represent 59% of the voters. So women are really, really important. Um, and in the infrastructure, the Diversity Leadership Council is going to be great because you're going to have one person who's been involved with the party, and then you're going to for a long time, and you'll have a millennial working with that person who basically helps to hand the torch to the millennial. And um, the state party reps are about to go to e almost every college in the state, which is um, absolutely wonderful. Um, we have, for the first time ever, paid internships with the state. We've never had that before, so we welcome that. That's a huge, because people who wanted to volunteer before but really had to work during the summers could not do it, so thank you for creating that. And December is the launch party for the diverse, Women's Diversity Council. So we learned a lot today, and I thought, as I always end everything, with the potential for you Oh, God, Karen, I, I always end with questions and candy. <laughs> this is all bad news for your dentist. Very expensive stuff to eat. I'm going to ask you, and they're relatively easy yeah, questions. Just closer, just closer. Close. Straight into it. They're relatively easy questions, too. So um, the first one is a giveaway. I'm just going to give this away to the youngest person in the room. And I think it's Haley. <laughs> Haley. I think it's Haley. Oh, okay. Yeah. 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 Share. That showed us that youth is really interested in what we have. Yeah. 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 Sorry, Gabe, I just couldn't give it to an elected official. I just but, you, but you had your hand. <laughs> Does anybody remember when the primary date is to the last date to register in the primary? April 7th. Ah!
Okay, Dave Coons had his hands up first, so can I give it to Dave? Sure. Dave, I want you to take a snake out of you first. Sorry, Fran. Oh, no, I'm so excited I do something. Thank <laughs> you. 